Today on The Pulse, if you want to take your business to the next level, you need to understand the power of partnerships. The old school of thought is that you need to beat your competition in order to succeed. But times have changed. Today we'll learn how joining forces with your competitors can help you worry less about losing sales and be able to focus more on growing your business. But first, tax day is quickly approaching. What do you need to know before April 15th? When we come back, let's talk business. Hello and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Denise Roberts. Tax Day is right around the corner and here to share what you and every small business owner should know is Shawanda Williams from Accounting and Tax Solutions. Shawanda is a certified public accountant and works as a financial manager for various businesses. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So April 15th, you know, is the day, but what, what I really want to drive home is that for business, every day is tax day. Isn't that right, Shawanda? That's correct, Denise. Every time you are expending expenses or incurring expenses on behalf of your business, it's tax day for you. All throughout the year, the business owner must be preparing um, for tax day all throughout the year. Okay, okay. Um, tax laws, they change all the time, right? Yes. Is there anything new that businesses need to be aware of? Well, to think about it, there are about two things I think that business owners need to be aware of for this year expire tax provisions, and of course, everyone knows about the Affordable Health Care Act. The expire tax provisions, a lot of them were legislated to expire in 2013. However, Congress had allowed some of them to go over to 2014. For example, um, the cancellation of the mortgage debt that was scheduled to end in 2013, but has been carried over for 2014 for those individuals who had to do short sales or may experience foreclosures. Um, the other thing is, of course, the uh, Health Care Act that has produced a lot of changes. For example, you have to have health care for everyone on your tax return this year. If not, there's a shared responsibility payment that the taxpayer has to incur. Also, for business owners, they get a tax credit for the health insurance okay. premiums on their businesses. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of rules and a lot of forms. So therefore, you definitely need to use the resources of a tax professional this tax year. So you mentioned the Health Care Act. How is that affecting businesses tax-wise? Like, is it, is it a negative or a positive impact? No, it's a positive impact. You get the credit for the premiums you pay, but at the same time, you're ensuring that all the, everyone in your business has health care insurance. Okay. So that's a great thing. Okay, all right. Um, how, what, what's the benefit of a tax, of having a tax expert, a tax expert such as yourself for business owners? Well, first of all, if you have complex financial situations, mm -hmm. you need a tax professional. Right. For example, if you're in business and self-employed, you definitely need a tax professional. If you have a major um, life-changing situation, sure. say, for instance, you're getting married, you're getting yes. a divorce, mm -hmm. you get an inheritance, you're thinking about retiring, these are the times you need to seek a professional. If you're dealing with real estate transactions mm -hmm. or investment income activity, yes. these are types of things where the laws are changing every tax year okay. and you need to consult a professional who knows these things all throughout the year. Sure, sure. Um, does the structure of your business affect the way your taxes are filed, you know, if you're an S corporation or a sole proprietorship? Yes, it does, Denise. That's one of the major problems I'm finding this tax season mm -hmm. among the clients that are coming in my office. Okay. They have structured their businesses only to find out that they're not getting the best benefit for the structure they have created. Mm -hmm. As a result, there are some entities that can be structured, such as 1120 S, S Corps, whereby they can have their income pass on to their personal, mm -hmm. and there are some others which they can't. So they're finding after the fact that they have incorporated the wrong way. So I encourage everyone who's interested in business to seek the help of an attorney or a tax professional before you incorporate to make sure you have the best business structure. Now, what if you get into some trouble with the IRS? Is it difficult 
to get back into good standing? How, how does that work? Well, first of all, you have to communicate with the IRS. And I find that most people are afraid of the IRS. Sure. You know, they get on the telephone, they have long waiting times, but you have to communicate and you have to make them aware of what your situation is. Sure. You also have to stick to the agreements mm -hmm. that you make with them right. and allow them uh, to help you. And don't be afraid to get the help of a professional if you need it. Okay. Um, I, I wish we had more time, but if, if, there, if anyone needs more information, is there a website they can go to if they have additional yes, questions? they can go to my website at www.axfin.com. We'll be more than happy to help you. Um, we do all types of consultation for tax professionals and financial planning. All right, Shawanda Williams, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Don't go away, we'll be back in 30 seconds. Another adventure with Savings Man. Look, honey, it's my social security statement. Oh, gosh, how are we going to retire on that? Never fear, young savers. It's Savings Man. You need to save more. You'll need this. Oh, the ballpark estimate worksheet. That's right. Get it at choosetosave.org and find out how much you'll need to save for your future. Gee, thanks, Savings Man. No, thank you. So visit choosetosave.org and stay tuned for more Savings Man. If you're always exhausted on April 16th every year and stressed out from filing your taxes, especially at the last minute, today's pocket-sized business tip will help you be a little more prepared for next year. Here are five tips to prepare your small business for next year's tax season, courtesy of NerdWallet.com. One, try bookkeeping online. It's better to be safe than sorry. So if you don't already, start saving all your receipts, keep them organized in a safe place, or you can store them online using apps like Shoebox and Neat. Two, separate personal and business deductions. Make sure that your personal and business expenses stay separate. As you calculate and divide up costs, check your personal bank accounts for any business expenses or employee rep reimbursements. Three, apply for an EIN. If this is the first tax season that you have employees or you recently restructured your business, you'll need to get a new employer identification number. Four, keep taxes for your employees and contractors straight. This is extremely important. Contractors file a Schedule E or Form 1090. Employees file W-2s. Since contractors don't have payroll taxes, mislabeling an employee as a contractor can look like tax evasion in the eyes of the IRS. And five, know the important dates. Your deadlines will depend on your business structure. For a sole proprietorship, your deadline for filing a Schedule C is April 15th. For an S corporation, the deadline is a bit earlier. If you miss your deadline, there will be penalties to pay. Overall, consult a tax professional to help you prepare your business for the inevitable. Hopefully, these tips will help you glide through tax season with minimal stress. Why my son would ruin himself with alcohol. Is someone's drinking breaking your heart? You might be surprised at what you can learn in an Al Anon family group from people just like you. Call 1 888 4 Al Anon or go to alanon.org. SD3's four-part miniseries is coming to a close with its final course on joint ventures and teaming. My next guest is here to talk about creating joint ventures that give results without hurting your own profits. Glenn Ivey is a corporate attorney with Leftwich and Ludaway. It's so good to see you. It's good to be here. So can you tell me what is the benefit of a company joining up in a partnership with another organization? Well, there can be a variety of benefits. Um, you know, one, it can give them a chance to get into uh, work that they wouldn't be able to get into by themselves. So teaming sometimes with a bigger uh, business, for example, will allow them to get onto uh, larger contracts. It can help them expand their networks uh, so that they meet new uh, potential uh, companies they can work with in the future. And also, you know, there's an opportunity for them to, to learn new subject matter areas mm -hmm. to maybe broaden the horizons of the work that they do and, you know, edge into other areas. 
Now, you've done a lot of these. Doesn't It seems like um, some businesses are just so hesitant to do it. Why do you think that is? What are they afraid of? Well, I mean, these deals go south sometimes. So, and I, I actually am representing companies right now that are in the middle of litigation. So, um, okay. but you know, every marriage doesn't end in a divorce necessarily. So, I think if you if you're careful about how you structure it at the beginning and you pick the right partner up front, it ought to go up, be able to uh, to work through the project and, and benefit sure. for both sides. And and and. You, you hit it right on. You said that it's like a marriage. It's, it's like a marriage. Absolutely. Which can be challenging. Very. <laughs> how, how do you know when it's the best fit? Well, I think you want to do due diligence up front. So, for example, you don't want to just joint venture with a business just because it looks good on paper. I think you want to make sure that there's, um, you know, sort of good chemistry between the people who will be working together. I think you want to make sure that uh, the background of the company you're working with uh, looks so like something you'd be comfortable with, for example, do they have a history of a lot of litigation with uh, litigation against other business partners? Um, when they get into arrangements, do they strong arm sometimes the smaller company and end up getting a bigger share of the business okay. than was thought to have happened up front? Sometimes those are private conversations that you have to have with people that you know in your, your circle, but you want to make sure you do as much of that uh, due diligence up front as you can. Okay, okay. So um, once you're, you've gone through the process and you're in the agreement, uh, what should go into the contract that would be, make it easy for you to walk away from the deal if you needed to? Well, that, that's not always easy to do because depending on you know, what deal you get into and how far along you get uh, going on it, sometimes it can be hard for you to just walk away from a deal if you're sort of midstream. So um, you really want to make sure up front that you have a good contract agreement if you if you need an exit provision uh, to you know for the comfort level you want to have a lawyer put that in there for you but but I think you're really you want to try and go into a deal with the hope that it's going to be able to work through all the way right. uh, but you need to have a lawyer help you draft your your joint venture agreement and make sure it's it's fair to you as well as to the other side sure um, before you enter the agreement what is, are there any red flags that you need to be looking for? Because you know sometimes we can get all caught up in the minutia. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the red flags that we should be looking out for? Well, I mean, to the extent there's, you know, there's there's sort of specifics in the agreement about how much work you get to do, especially if you're the smaller partner. How, make sure you you get uh, some guidance on how much work you're supposed to do and how much money you're supposed to get for it. What the revenue stream is going to be. In other words, does it come directly to you as opposed to going through your partner? Uh, sometimes, for example, in subcontract arrangements, the subcontractor has to wait for the money to come through the prime contractor, mm -hmm. and they might drag their feet in giving it to you. So you want to make sure you work those things out in advance to the extent you can. Uh, and also, again, if you're getting in bed with somebody that has a history of a lot of litigation with their business partners, mm -hmm. you should be very careful about that. Okay. How important is it for you to keep good records, and can you give an, give an example? Well, good records are always critical uh, for a variety of fronts. Your first guest who was talking about taxes is, you know, definitely, you know, a strong reason to keep good records. But sometimes as you're tracking the money when you're working through a project with a partner, um, you know, there are questions about how much work was done, when it was done, sure. uh, and how much money you should be owed. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a good reason to have uh, good records. And also if it results in litigation, I think it helps to build a stronger uh, case for your 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 uh, trial lawyers if it gets that far. Okay, and how do you maintain balance and fairness? You know, in terms of risks, um, risks and rewards for the partnership. Well, I mean, there is a risk as if you're the smaller partner and you don't have you're not you know sort of bargaining from a position of strength. Mm -hmm. It's, it can be risky for you sometimes, but you want to have a strong contract that helps to protect you and make sure you work as much as you can on building the, the proper relationships with your partner. Okay. All right. Um, Glenn Ivey, thank you so much for being here, for coming on today. Thanks for having me. The workshop, Sound Joint Venture Contracts and Teaming Agreements, will be held Thursday, April 9 at 1 p.m., located at the Spaldings Library in District Heights, Maryland. To register for the class, you can go to diversity.mypgc.us. And that's our show for today. If you missed anything, the show is posted on our website. It's diversity.mypgc.us. And click on the pulse. 
And we're all over the social media map. YouTube, Google+, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. We're there waiting for you to connect with us at PGC Diversity. Next time on The Pulse, we will find out the real scoop on how to do business with Prince George's County government. Until then, I'm Denise Roberts, and remember, in Prince George's County, your success is our success.